Hello and welcome to episode 167 of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin. Boy, I've got a bunch of stuff for you guys this week, releasing three episodes. The first one, this one, is my interview with artist manager Steve Weltman. And then I have my reviews of Lee Kerslake's album, Eleventeen, followed by my review of Ken Hensley's album, My Book of Answers. Why? Because I've been promising these for a while. Wanted to get Steve's thoughts on them before I uh, did the actual reviews of the albums. And uh, we, boy, he has been so gracious with his time in uh, patience and scheduling and just all the help he's given me since I first met him when I was getting the Uriah Heap Magicians podcast together. And uh, he's just been so generous and so friendly and kind to me and someone that I really appreciate. And I'm glad to get some time to sit down with him to hear his thoughts on these albums and on these artists and to hear some stories that I did not expect (laughs) that I would hear. Let me tell you something. His eyes have seen things. And uh, it was a great interview, had a great time talking to him, probably could have talked another couple of hours easily and still not scratched the surface, but he will be back. And he also has some very exciting news for us, which we will get to when he reveals it in the interview. So uh, let's see what's going on with me. Not a whole lot, pretty much the same as last week, still working on the new album that should be uh, done. Hopefully around mid-August is the target for release. Uh, My book trilogy is in editing. So things are moving along swimmingly. And uh, currently I am working on the Conquest album on the Uriah Heap uh, Magicians podcast and having a lot of fun with that. It's a, it's a different era for the band and enjoying getting into those songs. So without further ado, that's that's the there's really not a lot going on with me. It's a lot of work, but it's all consolidated down to some pretty simple explanation. So without further ado, let us bring on my friend Steve Weltman. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to bring on a fantastic artist manager who has really helped me with the Uriah Heat podcast. His name is Steve Weltman, and we're going to bring him on right now. Steve, how are you today? I'm good, thanks, Scott. It's good to good to be joining with you. It's great to hear your voice after all the emails. Indeed it is. <laughs> First of all, I, I have to say thank you because you were responsible for helping me get the interviews that I did with, with Ken and Paul Newton last year. Uh, mm-hmm. We had a very interesting and bizarre connection, you and I. Because the day that I got your contact information and reached out to you to get the interviews with them and uh, and Lee Kerslake, uh, about an hour after I sent that email, I started seeing the notices that Lee had passed away. And uh, you were kind enough to take a moment out of everything you were dealing with and write me in the morning and let me know he passed. And I thought, besides just being so incredibly professional, I mean, here's a stranger sending you a request and you took a moment... But in the emotion of it all, you still stayed professional. That has to be a difficult thing to manage all of that at the same time. Um, yeah, it's not something you can kind of replay and think, oh, how did I do that? But um, in the last particular, you know, kind of since Lee's diagnosis, um, you know, I spent a lot of time at, 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 at Lee and Sue's home and, um, and, and, you know, a lot of the time, because he was, you know, even over the, certainly the last three years, he was, you know, heavily medicated. So um, on the work side, I'd always make sure Sue was sitting in the room because uh, he might forget things. Sure. And, and, and you know, as well as Lee, um, you know, being, if you like, my friend, um, Sue became a great friend too, and and literally to this day, um, I speak to her every single day. Oh, that's nice. I, uh, Monday to Friday, and the weekends, she has her grandchildren, great grandchildren, and um, so we kind of skip weekends. And I go see her once a week, um, and uh, so. Well, thank you for the the kind words. I think that, um, you know, and I I don't want to be maudlin, but um, I I think that, uh, uh, you know, Lee was just, for 
forget how wonderful he was as a musician, but Levers are just a great human being. And and I think if Lee was in the same position and it was, you know, he would have done the same thing to you. Sure. You know, I, I, I was really happy that he finally did get his uh, rewards from the Ozzy Osbourne situation. But what I found out was he actually received that at the NAM show. And I was at the NAM show, had no idea he was there. So I, I missed another chance to meet him. Yeah, well, I... You know, there's been a lot of, you know, <laughs> speculation about that and, and how he got them. But Right. Uh, and I have to say, you know, publicly that, um, you know, I spoke to Sharon and it was Sharon who, who put it all together uh, and had them made at her cost. And, and, then, um, and then also shipped discs over to Lee with a handwritten note from Ozzy, which everybody will see them literally arrive at Lee's home, hmm. get unwrapped uh, in a documentary that has been filmed for the last few and a half years of Lee's life about his career in music and his fight against cancer. Um, and subsequent to that, which is what, two, three years ago, uh, the following year, oh, I can't remember which one. I think for Diary of a Madman, it, it gained another uh, level of platinum. So Sharon sent him another disc over. Oh, that was very nice. Yeah. I, I do like when things work out in the end. I mean, I'll never understand all of what happened there, and I don't really want to well, get I into it. Well, I wasn't involved. Um, all I can tell you is that it's over. Exactly. And I really, uh, I think we should move on from anything to do with that, except that Lee was happy that they were, albeit not close, um, <laughs> around the corner from each other, from London to LA, mm. but the things have been resolved. And, and there were positive things being said on both sides. Yeah, I'm just disappointed that I didn't get to see that at the NAM show. That that must have been just such a wonderful moment, especially for Lee after all those years and uh, being Absolutely. being at the building and not seeing it. That's that's hard. But you know, yeah, I mean, the thing about the NAM show and the, the so-called heavy metal hall of fame, you know, is what the hell have the Americans been doing by not inducting Uriah Heap into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? A long time ago. Well, I mean, Deep Purple just got in a couple of years ago, and and yeah. they just uh, they just said no to Iron Maiden. I I don't understand what they're doing at all. I I never have. I think they should just change the name to the Music Hall of Fame because it's not really just rock and roll. Uh, I want to see Heap get inducted. There's a petition out there. Uh, I'll put yeah. the link in the show notes, and uh, and everyone should sign up. But yeah, I, I'm with you. I I don't understand it. Well, the sad thing there is, you know, you're talking about if it happened, it would be posthumous awards. It's only Mick and Paul. Right. Yeah. Well, and see, that then it goes down to who do they let in from the band? They don't just say everyone who's ever been involved. They pick and choose, which also makes no sense to me. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, well, Trevor Boulder, I think, 37 years in the band. Mm -hmm. Not there. Bernie's been, what, 30 plus years? 30 plus, yeah. Yeah, and same as Phil. Mm -hmm. But Phil and Bernie were in a band in the 70s that we signed when I was at RCA. The band was called Grand Prix. Really? Yep. Wow. And I'll tell you a funny little story about that. You've been doing this for a little while. So, yes. <laughs> so, um, between 2012 and 2015, I spent three years talking to the then management of Uriah Heap, Ken and Lee, about doing a reunion show, mm. which I organized, and it was in Moscow in two, October 2015. So everything was signed, so we had to get visas. So in... in in the UK, if you have a visa for Russia, you have to go to the consulate and 
uh, for your final interview. Everything was set up for them, but you have to be electronically fingerprinted. Like when, when I enter the United States, I do fingerprints at immigration. Wow. But for Russia, you do it at the consulate. So I met every single one of heat, obviously Lee, me, all a heap, all the crew, everybody except Ken, of course, who lived in Spain. Right. So he was doing his there. And that's when I first saw Bernie and Phil for the first time since the 70s. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Ber Bernie's birthday yesterday. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's incredible. It was it was it uh was it just like you hadn't seen, you know, you hadn't spoken in a couple of days or was there some distance between you guys? I wouldn't say a couple of days, but we knew who we were, you know, it was, right. albeit we were all young men then, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, they're, they're both really good guys and, um, you know, and they, they all, all of, you know, heat as they are today were wonderful. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I put the service together for Sue, for Lee's, um, uh, cremation, mm -hmm. uh, which was Lee was um, not religious, so we just had a celebration. But we were limited by COVID law to thirty people. Oh wow! But um, well, all the current heat came except sadly Davy Rimmer, who was himself stuck in France. Oh no! Because, yeah, yeah, um, and of course Ken couldn't come. Yeah, he was very sad about that. He couldn't, he couldn't fly from Spain, mm -hmm. so... I'm surprised Bernie was there. Isn't Bernie in Canada? Bernie was there. He was fine. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, Bernie came. Yeah. Very nice. I'm sure it was a beautiful service, despite the limitations. Yeah, it, was, it was wonderful. It was uh, um, moving. And it, 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 there was also, you know, some good humor and some smiles which is what he would have wanted. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's interesting as I look at this album um, that, that he did, the last one, Eleven Teen, the cover itself is very visual, and I've been trying to figure out what it is that's behind Lee. It seems kind of like an elephant, but... It's a kind of like a dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah, it, because kind of Lee being, you know, I mean, the laughs we had about, you know... He's starting his first solo record at 72 years old. <laughs> but he did it. And he did it. I I have to say I love the packaging. I think it's it's absolutely stunning. I love the fact that the the print is big enough to where you can read it because that's always a complaint on how CDs are done. Uh, so true. The yeah. booklet is the pictures are just stunning. And yeah, they're, they're, yeah. They're really true. pleased with that. Yeah, there's a beautiful picture of Lee and Mick and Ken uh, in the bottom right corner that I, or bottom left corner that I just I just love that pic. There's so much joy and unity for guys that spent so much of their lives working together. Very true. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very yeah, beautifully I love, done. I love that shot too. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. on the back of that are the lyrics, which again, beautifully sized font, very readable. Uh, I, I think this is one of the best packages for a CD I've seen in years. Oh, that's lovely. I'll yeah. tell Sue. Oh, please do. Please do. I think it's fantastic. I, I started to read some of the reviews of this album, and I was kind of disappointed. It seems like some of the critics, and, you know, critics are critics, but they, they seem to be a little bit harsh on the album. And my view of the album is this is a guy who knew this was probably one of the last things he was going to do. It was an opportunity for him to just do what he wanted, unapologetically create an album he wanted to create. Would you say that's accurate? Uh, well, I think absolutely in terms of your description of the record. Um, I think in terms of the critics, I don't know what you've seen, but the majority of reviews we've seen here um, have, have been... I, either good or very good. Oh, good. Um, in in fact, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm just kind of mentally reflecting on 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 those. You know, the first eight nine weeks is when the bulk of the reviews come in 
mm-hmm. certainly from the UK side. Um, and and yeah, and the, the, I think there was one that I thought was a, a little unkind, mm-hmm. um, but the rest were, yeah, you know. But at the end of the day, um, it's easy to say when it's not you. Yes. Uh, and obviously I'm not making records, but you know, it's like when, when um, you can speak to sports people, you can speak to, you know, so-called, you know, musicians, or, you know, did you see that bad review? I don't read reviews. They say, yeah. You know, cause at the end of the day, it's down to what whoever buys it, you know, it's what they think. Mm-hmm. You know, and sad that we can't be at home with everybody who takes a copy home or watches something on YouTube out the blue. Think, oh, I like that. And they then stream an album or a track. Um, And, of course, you want the reviews to be um, fantastic, which rarely in the history of this business they are. Um, But, you, you, you know, you'd always want them to say, better things than, than 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 unkind things or worse things but at the end of the day you know and 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 it does reflect on the fact that lee physically is not here but you know he made the record we got it done and he got a record deal at 72 in in the midst of being very ill as well yes it's extraordinary it really is. And I personally, I think it's a fantastic album. And I really try to put, you know, all my love for Lee aside and really just listen to the music and, and take it as what it was. But I think it's a very emotional album. I think there's some fun stuff on this album. Uh, Port and a Brandy, for example, is just a well, that, fun yeah, piece. Port and a Brandy is how I opened the service. Oh, really? Yeah. Because he would have wanted that. Yeah. I, I would like to think he would want to be remembered that way, just having fun. Absolutely. Yeah. But then Absolutely. you get to a track like Mom and you just you just feel overcome with emotion. It's a very powerful track. It is. It is. And he'd he'd love he would love to have heard you say that. Uh, yeah. Do you think there's anything he held back? Other tracks, you mean? Yeah. No. There's Good. there's nothing. Good. No. Because if you're if you're gonna make an album and whether it's your first album or your last album, I think you should put everything into it. I think that it should be something that you you give everything to. Yeah, I mean, um, in the summer, uh, he was starting to uh, take uh, something that a melody that he he started um, previously, and was trying to develop it, and then we talked about should we hold the album and wait until he'd finished it and then record it? But then we decided we didn't want to stop the record as it was. And, and again, being positive, we said, right, we'll wait for the next record. Right. We'll develop it for the next album. So, sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, and, and you and I had talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but for me, um, I got the albums and then I kind of held on to them for a couple of days. I couldn't really get myself to start listening to it because uh, for one, uh, just the emotional side of things. But for two, there's that this is the last album that I'm going to hear for the first time from this artist that I've spent so much of my life listening to and learning from. Um, it was it was really tough to listen to it that first time just because that kept playing in my head. But once I was able to separate myself from that and really just listen to the music, I found the entire album highly enjoyable. There is not a track I don't like. Yeah, it's funny because, uh, you know, um, it's it's um, a lot of people have asked me, first with Lee and then with Ken, you know, um, oh, how long is it going to be before you can listen to their music? And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you probably can't listen at the moment, can you? And I said, quite the opposite. Listening to their music connects me. Yeah. You know, so I've I've not stopped playing their music, you know. Mm-hmm. That's a good um, thing. That's a very know, good thing. Well, it, it could be very ther- therapeutic for people too. Indeed. 
you know, but again, we're all different. So some people can't do it. Others can. Exactly. You know, it, it's what works for you. Now, I will say that uh, Celia Sienna, which is the opening track, and there's a video out there for, is a, just a beautiful song. I'm so glad that Lee was able to sing on this album. Oh, yeah, because his voice is great, even even given the condition he was in. Mm -hmm. and, and some actually, some of the reviews I was referring to talk about how good his voice was. I think it was very strong. Yeah. But if you go back, as you know, the history of Uriah Heap, I mean, one, one of the great things of, of the original Heap was, was the harmonies. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and Lee was an integral part of that. Well, and I had heard that he always did the high harmony. Yep. Now, you wouldn't look at a guy as big as he was and think that I he's going to sing like that. I know. I know. Let alone trying to sing and, and play as a drummer where you're so physically active and, and hit those harmonies. That's pretty stunning. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. impressive. And he was a great writer, too. That I can't comment on because, you know, I wasn't in the room when when they when they all contributed a heap songs. Um, and obviously for Eleven Team, for his album, yes, um, I, can, I can definitely say, I can certainly say it was, a, it was a good writer. I can't say it was a great writer because, unfortunately, we only have a, a short body of work. And, and, and we all use, you know, great or greatest or best ever or, you know, we use these words too loosely. That's fair. I, I guess I'm thinking of a song like Come Back to Me, which I actually recently just covered on the Uriah Heap podcast. Yeah, no. and that song, every time I hear it, it's just so powerful to me. It now, is. A, it's a great song. It is. But, but to be only fair, one of a few songs he wrote on his own. True. But to be fair, I don't know how much he wrote and then brought to the band and the band developed. Did he write the melody? Did he just write the lyrics? There's so much open question. But I can say that the song he was credited for writing is one that really touches me. Yeah, I, I think that, um, again, this is only surmising, but from what I understand, from, from certainly from Ken and, and from, from Lee themselves, was that uh, majoritively, um, you know, Ken would come up with something, um, be it um, on on a piano or a guitar, and kind of try and develop it, and then take it to the band, and then the band will put their touch on it. So on various songs, obviously, there'll be different writers, and for them to be get a writing credit will be dependent upon what they put into that song. So, but I wasn't there, so I can't sure. say. But there's also the performance side of it, right? So you can say, hey, I want you to play a solo that feels like this, and then it would take Mick to put his input in it as the performer and make you feel what was needed. So I think even on just the performer side, there's got to be a certain element of collaboration from everybody, whether they get a writing credit or not. Well, that, absolutely. That's called cool, being in a band. Exactly. And, and that's why on the show, I really don't get stuck in for the most part with going into those credits, because at the end of the day, every song, everyone touches. Definitely. Now, I wanted to ask you, because uh, I, I think people in general, really don't know what your job is. So I, so I just want to take a step back for a minute. Can you explain what it is that you do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, um, well, I've been in this business since, uh, oh God, far too long. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me just think. Uh, I've been in business about 55 years. Wow. So to explain what I do, I'd have to run you through all the classrooms I've been in in business <laughs> that have got me to the point. No. Okay. So, I mean, broadly speaking, from my perspective with, with, with and I think no disrespect to Lee, it'd be easy to explain with Ken. Because one, you know, I was with Ken longer, 11 years almost. And 
uh, can um, um, I met Ken by accident because a band that um, we'd signed in 1970 to their first record deal that subsequently uh, I was at the record label and the manager of the band who wasn't really a music man, but he was, he was wealthy, uh, was nagging me to leave the band to manage the band for him. Oh. Which I did about four and a half years later. And then, um, um, then sadly he died in a plane crash and I left the company. Um, but um, that band was called Nazareth. Oh, wow. And they're still my friends to this day. Um, and um, I'd been helping them since Daryl, the drummer, had died in 99 with a lot of their commercial affairs, their recording and, and publishing. Mm. And, and I'd done something for them, and they invited me over to see them at an outdoor show in the Czech Republic as a thank you over a weekend. And I get there, we get to the venue on the Saturday and I see this poster and it's got special guests, Ken Hensley and live fire. Hmm. And I said, shit, I haven't seen Ken Hensley since 1973 in London. Wow. So that late afternoon, I went out to the sound desk and I watched Ken perform and his band. And they were brilliant. Mm -hmm. Ken was like a kid on behind his organ. Yeah. Great energy, singing well. And um, the first words I said on this planet to Ken Hensley were, it's like when Ken's last song was Lady in Black, and I walked back through the audience to backstage, and a promoter came over to me and Pete, the bass player, and said, um, he said, look, he said, um, you can't let Ken do an encore because we have a curfew. Otherwise, you'll have to shorten your set. So Pete looked at me and said, well, will you have a word with Ken and tell him he can't do a curfew? <laughs> so Ken came off stage and the crowd are going crazy. 5,000 people limit. Sure. And if that's the first thing I said to him, I said, uh, great show, Ken, but you can't do an encore. There's a curfew. And that, that was the only time I saw him that night. The following morning, everybody was staying in the same hotel. I came down for breakfast. And about 10 minutes later, this voice, I was like looking at my food, and the voice says, uh, can I join you? And it was Ken. And he sat down with his plate of breakfast. And, uh, and we talked for about an hour and a half and um, just about the business and this, that, and the other. And then about five, six days later, he called me and he said, um, Steve, he said, you know, I told you I live in Spain. I said, uh, yeah. He said, look, if I send you an air ticket, would you come down to see me? And I said, Ken, look, you know, coming down for a weekend to Spain in the summer is always welcome because it's great weather. But, you know, what about? And he said, about representing me. And I said, well, I'll certainly come down and talk to you. And sure enough, within two hours, a flight ticket arrived. I went down the following weekend. But I spent a weekend Googling Ken Hensley. And I saw the last record he'd made was 2007. And he, he wasn't really doing many shows. And his band, Live Fire, who I thought were fabulous, he had not made a record with. There was nothing. So we started talking, and uh, and he's and I when I put this to him in Spain, I said, um, I said, uh, so why haven't you made any records with Life Fire? And he said to me, Steve, he said, look, I'm getting on to 65. Nobody's going to sign me now to make records. Mm. And I think uh, that was 2010, I think, in in the well in the ten and a half years we were together, 
I think we've made nine albums, ten albums. <laughs> and, and I can't talk about it to the public, let alone you. Um, but I have a new record of Ken's, which we actually recorded in 2019. Oh. Uh, and then pandemic and the manifestation of my book of answers arose so we decided it would be always best to come out you know late this year mm -hmm. um but we can't even consider doing a deal with the label of talking to us because ken's estate is all in probate oh so you can't do anything till that's over and that can go on for a while and and it's the record he always wanted to make, uh, and it is absolutely fantastic. It's very different, uh, but I can't talk about it. But I think that's the 10th album we've done together. Well, I'm very excited by this news because, you know, I, I'm certainly a huge fan of Ken's and, uh, you know, knowing that there's some more out there that will eventually make it out. Uh, that's that really warms my heart. Thank you for letting me know. No, absolutely. And, and, you know, in terms of, you know, I'm also working on plans on different kind of ideas, what his, his let's say, his solo works and his live fire works for the future. And, you know, I've been working with BMG literally hand in glove for the whole of your eye heat for a long time. And, you know, I, well, we have two fantastic projects that you'll hear about the, um, I think you're going to hear about one of them, social media at the end of the month, and the other one you'll hear a bit later, and they're both going to come out in September this year, and they are fantastic. Great. Um, and there's a special vinyl of Look at Yourself, a record store day. Um, and, um, and we have projects that Ken knew about that I've been working on, a lot of them, some of them are my ideas with BNG right through to 23. Oh, fantastic. I'm so excited by this. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll have to tell you what I do. Yes. What do I do? Okay. So basically, um, you know, whether it's a new act or, you know, a, an established act, you know, you look at uh, uh, what, what their thoughts are, are, how creative they are, are they writing, you know, what kind of record do they want to make, who do they want to make it with, who's going to be playing on it, where are you going to record it, who the producers potentially could be. Then you've got to go and cut the deals with the record companies, the publishers, unless you've already got a publishing deal, but then you've got to liaise with them so they know what you're doing. Then you've got to liaise with the record companies about everything, social media, production, artwork, manufacturing, planning, selling, promotion, videos if you're making them, um, you know, what promoters you're talking to, what agents you're talking to, what shows you're going to do. And certainly in Ken, with Ken, um, in my ten and a half years, I think we only ever used an agent for about four months. Oh, wow. Otherwise, I've done it all myself. So I've dealt with shows literally all over the world. Do I do all the contracts? Um, you know, we've never had any legal issues with record companies or publishers or shows in my in my entire time with Ken. Um, and unlike sadly many other acts who spend fortunes with lawyers, I think Ken's only ever had to spend about. $750 in legal fees in 10 and a half years. That's amazing. That's, that's more than, uh, you're less than people spend in a day. Most of the time. Yeah, you're damn right. Yeah. <laughs> so this explains to me now why, when I get emails from you, they might come in at one o'clock in the morning, 12 in the afternoon. <laughs> like you really don't have a lot of room to sleep. Oh, well, no, I get my sleep, but I'm, you know, because I'm, you know, a lifetime, in America and still, you know, with business and with friends, um, you know, my my evening may finish at, you know, seven or eight o'clock, but, 
maybe a friend of mine might send me a personal email or a text or a WhatsApp, um, and it just makes me think, oh, oh, Scott sent me a mail. I'll, I think I'll reply to that now. Mm-hmm. But the, the luckiest thing, I suppose, and I'm not alone here, there's many of us from my era, is, you know, I don't have a job. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what I do. Right. You know, I, I don't think about, oh, I've got to get up early or I'm going to have to stay up late. It's what I do. It's my oxygen. I think people don't understand a lot of times how deeply involved you guys get. For example, you know, Ken hadn't done an album in so long, and then he starts working with you, and boom, he's putting out material that we all can enjoy. Uh, you were mentioning your involvement with the Uriah Heat box set, and that it was your idea for them to do their own individual compilation CDs and, and talk about why they picked those songs. That kind of stuff that people just think that the artists come up with, a lot of times it's the management that comes up with those ideas. Yeah, but and also and also the record company. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and a lot of the time, you know, record labels, um, you know, uh, of, of, if you like, victimized, you know, they don't do anything. They don't do this. But, you know, uh, you know, our relationship with BMG, my relationship with BMG is excellent. And, and they're a great company to work with. They're good, good people. And I think they're... As far as a big company is concerned, they're about as artist friendly as you could get. You know, now, okay, it's this is at the end of the day, this is what's termed today a heritage act. So, so they should be. Right. And, and you, you have know? to give them credit for surviving. I mean, it's not like it was in the 70s where there were new record companies popping up every day. It's really small now. Sure. Yeah. No, very, very true. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we are in a different world today in every sense. Um, you know, this industry, you know, was built by music people. Today, majoritively, it's people in business. It's business people whose business is music. Right. But, you know, if you go back, you look at, you know, Mo Austin and, 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 and some gang at Warner's, Armour Ertigan, David Geffen, Jack Holtzman, um, Chris Blackwell, Tony Stratton-Smith, who started Charisma, um, you know, Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. These were all independent companies, great music people. Some of them built empires. Sure. You know, I mean, Armour Ertigan, you know, Atlantic, for me, maybe the greatest record band ever. Um, who I luckily could count as a friend um, and a mentor, um, you know, built a massive company. Mm -hmm. But what people don't know is, you know, I think the first two acts he signed were in the the end of the 40s, beginning of the 50s, Ruth Brown and a guy called Ray Charles. No kidding. Oh, yeah. Wow, that was a good pick. Yeah, you know, and then, of course, the whole, you know, Otis Redding, a wreath. I mean, the Stones, Zetlin, you know, it just goes on and on and on, on and on and on. And as much as people complain about record companies and how they, you know, they're controlling everything, without the record companies, we wouldn't have heard so much of this great music that we've been enjoying for decades. Yeah, I, again, though, I think it's different. I think that, you know... I mean, artists today, kids today, you know, when I was a kid, but you, you would take Liverpool, okay, because we all know Liverpool. Sure. Right? That I remember reading a review in the 60s in, I think it was a Melody Maker or, or the NME, uh, with, with a young act. can't even remember what the act was. And it says, oh, I think the kid was 19 years old. He said, why are you in music? He said, well, he said, I'm a Liverpudlian. He said, so, you know, I, I didn't go to university. I don't have any real qualifications. I love music. So I had a choice. Crime, sport, or music. I didn't want to be a criminal. <laughs> I'm very good at sport. 
and I love music. There you go. Okay, so, you know, I mean, it it was a commitment from everybody, from the act to want to try and be an act and develop and become successful. But most of the time they just wanted to see if they could just earn a living doing what they love doing. Sure. And some of them, not many, but some of them made it and are still there. Some of them made it and have fallen off the radar, although a lot of bands that we haven't heard of, you know, have come out of the woodwork in the last five or six years, and they're touring again. Yeah, which is great to see because there's acts that you might have thought, I'll never get to see these people perform, uh, Mm -hmm. like Edgar Winter. And Edgar Winter was opening a show for Alice Cooper in Deep Purple a a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. And so I got to see Edgar Winter perform, which was amazing because I never thought I would see that in my life. Uh, uh, and there you go, Alice. I mean, what what a what a real icon. Oh, unbelievable. Well, we did a show, was it? I can't remember if it's four years ago. Uh, we were doing a an outdoor show in Russia because Ken's biggest live market was Russia. Mm-hmm. And we were doing an outdoor show for a promoter that we'd done previously as well and uh, we knew it'd be sold out but he he wanted Alice Mm. and he wanted Alice to come and play but with Ken and the boy Ken and Li-Fi playing with Alice Ooh. so you know we spoke to Alice's people and we set it all up and Alice came over with his guitar player and um Ken and Alice did this big press conference in a shopping mall. <laughs> and and, and in, a, in, a, in a town called Krasnodar. Um, in, it, that's uh, kind of near Sochi, uh, where they have the Russian Grand Prix. Um, and, um, and it was just, it was extraordinary. You've got like three levels of shopping mall. And all the balconies are covered with people looking down. Oh, sure. Know? And then I'm talking to both the pair of them at the show in in uh, in the dressing room, you know. And there's there's these two rock and roll freaks, and they're both absolutely massive Christians. And then you're thinking, hang on a minute. Well, you know, Ken did this, and Alice did that, and they have such great faith. You know, and and it was odd. Did they end up doing the show? Oh, we did the show, yeah. I bet that was amazing. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. I did get to meet Alice very briefly uh, a couple years ago at the NAMM show. He made kind of a surprise appearance for Sure Microphones. And I heard about it uh, th- that morning. And I ended up standing in line for four and a half hours to get about 13 seconds with him. But it was worth it because I got to shake his hand. I got to say thank you for all the music, for everything I've enjoyed, everything I've learned from you. That's a pretty big thing. Like I'm not big on I have to meet celebrities. I'm big on thanking people who have had a profound influence on my life. You know, and Ken Ken was definitely one of those people. And I had had a few email chats with Ken back in the 90s and uh actually did a cover of Cold Autumn Sunday, which he thought was pretty good. And he might have just been being very kind, you know, but uh, we had lost touch. I met Roger Glover from Deep Purple, and Mm -hmm. uh, I was telling him, I said, well, you know, Ken Hensley was telling me that you guys shared a rehearsal space at uh, the Hanwell Community Center when when he was starting out and, and Deep Purple Mark II was just starting. And he goes, oh, yeah, Ken's such a great guy. And he was telling me a little bit about it. And he goes, well, tell him I said hello. And of course, by that point, I had lost touch with Ken. And so I said, well, if I ever talk to him again, I I certainly will. So when you had arranged the interview for Ken and I, uh, and Ken was so gracious, he was sitting in his car doing the interview because he said, I have a bunch of dogs and your recording isn't going to be very good if I go in the house. (laughs) But uh, he said, uh, I told him the story. I said, well, you know, I know this was like 25 years ago, but I just wanted to let you know that Roger said to say hi. And he just laughed and said, I think I've seen him since then. (laughs) Well, I I didn't know Roger well at all, but of course, Roger produced two of the great early Nazareth albums. Yes. 
Now, was that before you started working with him or after? Uh, I'm just trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Um, well, I know it was before Hair of the Dog. Definitely, he... definitely uh, the Rampant album. Mm-hmm. Um, no, just that one, actually. Okay. The one before was, uh, for, uh, you know, I was still at the record label. Well, the connections that Roger Glover has to Heap are pretty astounding because he's the one that recommended John Lawton. Yeah, sure. After doing the Butterfly Ball. And, you know, I just finished uh, recording the last of the uh, albums that uh, Lawton did for the Uriah Heap podcast. And I have to say, I really thought he was a good choice. I thought he brought a lot to the band, but uh, the music was phenomenal. Very different. Yeah, production is... um... Uh, been a big part of my life and and i i uh can't claim to be a musician or a songwriter but i i have well i don't i don't even know if it's humble i think it's just experience you know i've seen a lot of records made and by a lot of different producers i've seen a lot of artists labels in interview producers Mm -hmm. and make wrong decisions where the producer's kind of sold himself and 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 you get in the studio and or you hear the outcome and, and you find that it's somebody just doing a job right. who hasn't actually climbed inside the material. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I've worked with some incredible producers. Um and in fact the album I can't talk to you about with Ken I let's say was one of our most healthiest debates. Mm. because when I came up with the idea of doing it, I said to him, oh, you're not going to produce it. And he said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you're not going to produce it. And he said, Steve, he said, even when Jerry Brom was producing Heap, I was always sitting next to him at the mixing desk. Mm-hmm. And since I left Heap, you know, I've always produced myself. And I said, Exactly. And he said, what do you mean exactly? And I said, well, I actually don't believe you should produce yourself. I don't believe any artist should. And he went, why? I said, it's a different craft. It's a different skill. Well, and I think you need an objective opinion, too, if you're doing all the stuff. Well, absolutely. So, so, so the debate kind of evolved, and he said, well, who's going to produce me? <laughs> well, that's and a good I, point. And I said, well... I've, I've, I've got a guy, and there's actually two guys, and I want you to meet them. So Ken was like a child. He's like, oh, well, if I have to. And then he said, oh, okay, I'll come over. So I can't go much beyond that, but I picked him up at the airport and drove him um, down to meet the people. We met in the kitchen, and... And literally, I introduced them all and let them talk and kind of sat there pretty quiet for just over an hour. Mm -hmm. And then Ken said to the other two, um, he said, I'm I'm just going to nip outside and have a cigarette. So I went with him. And we got outside and he said, Steve, I love them. Uh They're brilliant. And um he sent me a mail, actually, in April last year, Scott, which I, I can't read to you now because it's in my office uh, in the other room. And uh, But basically, thank me for putting it all together, saying it's the record he always wanted to make. Um, and it is he ends with, my eternal thanks. Mm. I love that. But it's, it's, it's different, Scott. You know, producers, it's like, in 1983, I was managing director of Charisma Records, and I signed Julian Lennon to his first record deal. Oh, wow. And Julian had never been in the studio. And I actually did a license deal with Armit at Atlantic before we'd even made a record. Mm-hmm. And I wanted a professor. I didn't want a hip kid. I wanted a professor that Julian can learn from. So I met and hired Phil Ramone. Mm. And at the beginning of that session, which actually started at Muscle Shoals, 
You've got, picture this, you've got a control room. Bradley, Phil's engineer at the desk, sitting next to him, Phil Ramon. At the furthest point at the back of the room is Julian Lennon because he doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, we did all the tracking there. Then we went up to upstate New York, more tracking. Then it comes time to mixing. So I go over. I arrived on the second day at mixing at the studio. And there's Bradley, the engineer at the desk, with Julian sitting next to him. Phil at the back of the room with his New York Times and his phone <laughs> and, you know, speaking to his stockbroker or reading the paper and now and then sticking his head from behind the curtain. Now I prefer the first vocal and then putting his head back and letting Julian get on with it. Wow. And that record was, I still think, the biggest debut selling album in Charisma's history. I would believe that. Well, I, you know, there's probably a lot of expectation for somebody who's the son of such a famous artist. But are we talking about the album that had Much Too Late for Goodbye on it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. For a lot. Okay. Yeah, for a lot. That a beautiful song. That's another yeah. one of those that every time I hear it, it just it just hits me in the heart every single time. Yep. Magic. And what a great first album. Yes. It's a shame what happened afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Well, do, do you think that, though, there was a, an extreme amount of pressure on him just because of who he was? Oh, no. I mean, he is, you know, he's, well, he's in his 50s now, but he's a wonderful young man. Mm -hmm. um, he's a caring person. He's got a great heart. Very funny, like his father. Mm -hmm. Well, not like his father, but he's funny. Right. Um, okay. But, um, you know, Julian was a kid. He was... He, Julian didn't have a, a beam when we signed him. And then he had all his success, money coming in, and he did what a lot of young people did. He parted. Mm -hmm. And I, a year after Tony, who owned the company, sold it to Virgin, I stayed on for a year. I didn't think where it was going was right for me because Virgin was a big company and I, I was a rebel. So I left. And next thing I know, I got Phil Ramone on the phone to me asking me to listen to mixes for Julian's second record. And there were about five songs that we'd rejected for the first because he didn't have enough material. Uh -huh. And sadly, between Virgin and, and Atlantic, they didn't stop him and and make him go away and write, they put a record out, which, you know, I think still went gold, but it was nowhere near what the first record did. And then I think he just, um, whether it was pressure or wrong choices, chose the wrong people. Um, and, um, and then at the end of the 90s, he, he, you know, he'd uh, made up with Yoko and, he made his own record. Um, I put a label together for him. I did the deals for the record with him. But the uh, his people and everything that went with it, they just didn't know how to approach the record business and getting it done. But it ha had some really good songs on it. But he's, at the moment, he's not particularly bothered about music. He's a great photographer, you know. Oh, Okay. You Google him and look at his work. It's wonderful. Will do. Well, you know, as long as you're doing what makes you happy, that's the thing. You know, it's it's not like you have to be in music. If if it's something that you tried and, you know, you didn't like for whatever reason, whether it's circumstance mm -hmm. or it just didn't really hit you the way you thought it would, mm -hmm. uh, as long as you're doing what makes you happy, that's all that really matters. The problem mm -hmm. becomes the public coming in and saying, well, I want you doing this. Well, you don't really have a right to want that. Well, you could want it, but you don't have a right to force that on the artist. That's correct. I see a lot of that. I hear a lot of that with Richie Blackmore, too, since he, you know, uh, brought Rainbow back for a couple of shows and goes back to Blackmore's Night. And, and the rock and roll crowd wants him doing rock and roll. But if that's not what makes him happy, you know, he's, he's certainly given us enough to where we don't have a right to say you need to do this or that. No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I uh, I have to tell you a quick story before we wrap up. Um, so 
to further the the odd timing of the relationship that you and I have had, my friend. Yes. So I spoke to Ken, and uh, I remember talking to you about being really concerned about the time changes because it was right when the time was changing in the fall. And mm -hmm. uh, I looked at it and I thought, okay, I've got it. I've got the number. It's all programmed into my phone because I'm always concerned about international dialing and timing with with artists and people I respect. Uh, and so I called Ken and I and it went immediately to voicemail. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just give him a few minutes. You know, maybe he got a call or whatever. And I I called again and he picked up and he said, well, I thought you were going to call me in an hour. And I thought I messed up the time change. Well, it turns out that the time change in Spain is on a whole different day than the time change in America. It's an hour different to England. Right, but it's on a different day. It's what's called Central European time. And so I called him too early, and he said I was in the middle of a, a heated debate with a videographer that he was working with, putting a, <laughs> a piece of video. Like He said, you could not have called it a worse time. <laughs> I felt so bad, you know. But he was so gracious. I mean, just being willing to sit in his car while the sun was coming up and, and every, I, he just such a, a kind man. And he even said, when I got the sheet that said that I had an interview with you, he says, I recognized your name right away. I couldn't remember where I knew you from, but I remember your name. And I thought, we haven't talked in 25 years. That's pretty amazing. I, that really made me feel good. Um, and then, the, uh, the next week the interview comes out, I send you over the link. And Ken had said to me, the last thing he said to me was, please keep in touch with me because I really want to help with the podcast. I have memories of every song, every recording. I have a lot I can share. And I was so excited by that. And so when I wrote you, I said, here's the link to the yeah, no, interview. I mean, he, he, he really genuinely loved the idea of what you were doing. I mean, he really did. That means so much to me. And, uh, well, no, it's, and it's very sincere. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I send you the link and, and I say, you know, please give Ken my email so that we can stay in touch however he wants to do it. And you wrote me back and you said, I'm sorry to tell you that Ken passed away last night. And I'm like, I, I was just so yeah. in shock well, Bec we, because we it, wasn't, it wasn't like Lee, because we knew for a long time that Lee was ill. Yes. No, I mean, quite simply, uh, Monica called me on November the 3rd in the morning and said, I'm taking the Ken to hospital. He's got some shortness of breath and he's got a bit of a temperature. So, of course, you know, especially last year, even, you know, you immediately think COVID. Sure. Two of the symptoms shortness of breath, temperature. So, they get to hospital on the third, late morning. Once they get him in, um, they give him a COVID test, negative. Under the law in Spain, in COVID, if you have a test in hospital, you have to remain there for 48 hours. And you have one more test, then you can go home. Okay. So uh, Monica uh, left him there. He had his own room. She went home, brought him back his laptop. I spoke to him, uh, in, well, uh, English Spanish time about six, no, it's English time about 6.30. And it was an absolutely normal conversation that we'd have every day because we spoke every single day once, sometimes twice. Mm -hmm. And so we had a normal conversation and it literally ended with Ken saying, God, it's so boring in here. I've got my laptop. He said, I can't wait to go home Thursday. I said, okay, I'll speak to you tomorrow. And that was it. He said, ta-da. And then in the morning, Monica called me and said, I'm on the way back to the hospital. His health's deteriorating. I'll call you later. So I couldn't even tell you how many times on and off she called me. And then we got into the evening. They were doing tests on him. He had another test for COVID, negative. They were doing tests on him. She called me about 7.15 and said he's gone into a coma. And five minutes later, she called me and said he's gone. Wow. Just like that. And he seemed fine. You know, when I spoke to him, he was just so full of energy and yeah, uh, no, just, just like any time. Yeah. He, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he certainly, you know, I mean, he worked very hard on 
my book of answers, making all the videos and everything. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was just absolutely from nowhere. Did he really, in your opinion, did he really take a lot of time for himself to enjoy life or was he always working? Um, it's, well, no, it's not difficult to answer. I think that, um, you know, if Ken was here, the first thing he'd say to you is music is his life. Yeah. Absolutely music is his life. Um, and he, if you like it, he pretty much always had a notepad near him. Mm-hmm. But no, when he was at home, he knew how to relax. You know, they have a beautiful home, mm-hmm. not ostentatious, it's a working home. They've got so many animals. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got sheep, they've got chickens, they grow every kind of vegetables, they've got their own olive trees. Wow. Got, you know, nine dogs, ten cats. <laughs> um but, you know, they've got a lovely pool, it's, the climate's great, you know, and he'd like nothing better than lying in the pool, having a cold beer and, you know, but, um, but music was his life. And I have to say, uh, much like Lee's album, My Book of Answers, the packaging is, is fantastic. Um, there, there are some lovely pictures in the book. And again, the book, the, uh, the font is really nice. It's very readable which I appreciate. You had some beautiful words that you put uh, on the back cover of the booklet that I thought were very touching. Yeah, that was really odd because the record company actually, uh, the managing director called me and said, look, we, we really think you should you know, write something. And I said, what's the deadline? And they said, could you do it by the end of the week? I think it was a Tuesday. And I said, oh, I'll think about it. And... Uh, and then literally I just sat down with a piece of paper and a pen, not a keyboard, and, and just wrote something. Then I typed it out, changed it a bit, then I rang Monica and 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 just said, Look, they've asked me and I read it to her and she thought it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I agree. They were very beautiful words. I, I don't think you could have said it any better. No, thank you very much. Very kind. And and it shows how much he meant to you and obviously still means to you, uh, but just, just such an amazing artist. And I think this is a very interesting album because this isn't an album that he just wrote. This is an album that he partnered with somebody who wrote the stories and he put the music to it. And it's it's different, but it's very enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, you've read the story. I mean, basically, you met a guy in an airport queue who couldn't speak a word of English. Um, they used the stewardess on a flight to exchange information. Uh, the guy was a devout Christian and a poet, an amateur poet, and asked Ken if he'd write some music to a couple of the, so- uh, the poems. That's, that was the birth of it. And so he did a little home demo, whatever the first or second song was, Send it to Vladimir, and basically the rest is history. <laughs> and it's it's amazing to have a kind of collaboration with somebody that you have a communication challenge with. Yes, yeah, extraordinary. But I mean, the album is beautiful. It's a little dark here and there. Um, well, it's very dark. Let's be honest. It's very yeah. dark. <laughs> but it's very you emotional. Know, you don't know, have you... to be about bush stuff. Mm. It's dark. Yeah. But you feel something in every song. I mean, that's one thing that Ken was brilliant at, was really making me feel something with everything he did. Yeah, very much so. And, and obviously, and in Vladimir's case, I mean, Vladimir, in his own words, shouldn't be alive because he had a massive accident mm-hmm. in his, when he was younger um, and has damage to his spine, which he still receives treatment for. Um, and he's a very successful businessman in his country. Um, and, um, you know, uh, or maybe I didn't send them to you, um, but I actually, to help promote the album, I had a series of questions written, which we sent to Vladimir. I had him read them in, you know, answer them in Russian mm-hmm. and then have them translated into English and also do the same thing in writing. So I could send those to you if that interests you. Oh, I would love to see that. But I promise you I won't be doing that tonight. (laughs) No, not at all. No, that's fine. 
whenever you have the time. I, I appreciate no, you'll, it. You'll, you'll definitely get it by Monday. Oh, great, great. Or well, on Monday. Um, let me just make a note because I am going to have to go in a moment. Yes, I, I can't thank you enough for, <clears throat> excuse me, all your, your generous time and these stories. Not at all. I mean, any time. I mean, we can do this again. I would love that. I would love that. You've been so kind to me, uh, you know, since we met last year. And I want to tell you, too, that I really appreciate that. Most of the people that I've met in the business that are really in the business have just been the nicest people. You know, Ace, your I Heaps manager, uh, has been very nice and kind. Mick himself has been great. Uh, Ken was somebody that I really had looked forward to um, building that relationship with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unfortunately, we never got to do that, but he was somebody that I got along with very well. And um, just I've really met some great people that I appreciate. But to get to t to tell someone who has had a huge impact on you as a musician and and just as a fan of music, to be able to say thank you to them for that, that is the greatest thing for me to be able to give an artist. Well, I understand that fully because in a different way, um, you know, in, in my first job, Scott, um, I was a tea boy, you know, gopher for the Beatles. Oh, wow. So my, 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 you know, like every kid in Britain, I loved the Beatles and, and I was always a John man. Mm -hmm. And the first three weeks I was there, the few times they came in the office, I sat there, you know, mouth agog. And, and then I realized, cause I, you know, I spoke to them and they just spoke to me. Right. And they had one head and two arms, just like me. And that's how I've been all my life. Um, you know, we, we, you know, and I've met pretty much all of them. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I, I have three autographs I've ever asked for in my life. One is Frank Sinatra. Hmm who signed my passport because I was sitting next to him on Concord Wow! in the eighties. Another one is, was, um, I was being flown by my company in first class in the early seventies to New York. And I was sitting next to Bette Davis. Really? Yep. So I have her autograph. And the other one you may or may not know, unless you like classical music, but is Herbert von Karajan. I do know that name. Okay, well, he was considered the maestro, the conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. And I flew in 1980, I was in Tokyo, and I flew back to London uh, on Japanese airlines in first class, sitting next to him. We played, he had an electronic chessboard, and we put it out in a, on the table between us, and... It was nine hours London to Alaska, an hour off the plane, and nine hours into eight and a half into London. And I think we only ever made two moves. <laughs> we just talked all the time, Annette. Um, and he was a genius. Wow. You have had quite a life, my friend. So far. Yes. But you've given us so much, whether people really understand your contributions to the industry or not. I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Because so much wouldn't have happened if it wasn't. Again, that's very kind. But you know what you do? And just by loving music and what I do, it's because I do what I do for the same purpose to, you know, help artists, to encourage people that, that love the arts, you know, and it, and it takes all of us. It if does. I wanted, you know, if I wanted my name in lights, I'd have been a performer. Mm -hmm. But I never, that was never for me. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable in my own skin, Scott. Well, we need you, you know, to do what uh, you do. So thank you. And thank, thank you. you so much for taking some time. I look forward to doing this again. It's been great. I hope you have a wonderful night, my friend. And you too. And um, I, I will get over uh, the Vladimir things to you in, in the next few days. Fantastic. Well, you have a wonderful night. And thank you for your time, my friend. You are awesome. Very welcome. Thank you, Scott. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I am certainly incredibly excited about this uh, additional album from Ken Hensley. Uh, it was 
really thrilled to know that there would be another one. And you know, you never know with these artists what might be in the archive, but I would imagine that at least with Ken, I know with Lee, uh, you know, most of the work that he did as a session player is pretty well known. I know with Ken, there's always the chance there's some stuff in the archive. I guess time will tell, but at least we know there's one more coming. Let's hope it gets out there soon. And that will do it for this show. I want to thank Steve for coming on and being such a gracious guest. Uh, so many great stories and uh, always just a, a pleasure to talk with such truly great people in the business. People who I can say, you know, I'm proud to be a part of this business because of the colleagues that I have. So thank you, guys. We will see you in the next episode where I review Lee Kerslake's album, The Eleventeen.